me today have uh, Dr. Binny Kujakos, and it is very difficult to introduce him because he has got a lot of credentials. Uh, but the best part is that uh, he has done a lot of projects which is out of the book. And uh, he has been teaching a lot of organizations like IITs, IAMs, and he has been spearheading the Musris project. One of the talks that I heard that he has been, he has given in Bombay was uh, really uh, opening a lot of standards on architectural conservation, how we employ other professionals into the field, and how we manage to get the projects, how to get the funding, how to get the sanctions, etc. So that is something that we'll be definitely looking forward to. To start with, uh, let me uh, give some of my experiences working with uh, conservation architects in the field. Uh, so, should can I, if I can share my screen? Is that on? Yes. Good. Okay. So, uh, luckily for me, I I was start I started my profession and my training uh, with Sanjay sir uh, when I was in Intech and uh, in the beginning stages of my career somewhere in 99 2000 only I have been working with uh, conservation architects uh, in a project in uh, Kishan Court in Punjab but, uh, on which a talk had happened in uh, last week between uh, Gurmeet Rai and uh, Dr. Sabya Sachi. Uh, so I was involved in that project and from there on I have been working in close relationship with conservation architects and uh, luckily since I was I have been working in the field of wall painting conservation it is not very uncommon to work in collaboration with conservation architects. So uh, I, I'll be sharing some of my information and some what I, what I learned from uh, working on sites uh, with conservation architects and with the community and what art conservators doesn't learn in their schools and their conservation programs. So first of all, we, uh, if you look at the screen, this is uh, Shogun Rinpoche uh, con deconsecrating the uh, Sumda Chun temple after the, consecrating the Sumda Chun temple after the conservation work has happened. Now, dealing with the community is only something that you learn at site. So how to respect them, how to respect their ideals, etc., comes from working on the field. And uh, the other photograph, other slide that you, other photograph that you see on the slide is uh, at Hanle Monastery. Uh, it's extreme uh, and in the uh, uh, in the borders of Ladakh, China border. And here, they, I mean, this happens in monasteries and temples where they have been lighting lamps, and that is their belief and how to deal with them. And how to, if you, you can't just tell them stop it. So that is how you deal with community. And uh, this is def definitely something that you learn uh, when you work on site. But coming to my favorite site, uh, where I worked for about five years is Sumda Chun in Ladakh. So this is the temple of Sumda Chun. Now you see this is a mud plaster temple, mud, mud roof. And uh, we have been working with a conservation architect, uh, uh, Ajay Deep Singh Jamwal who has been working with us on, uh, we worked with us for on site for this five years continuously. So a, a continuous dialogue with him was required to make sure this temple looks in its original authentic way because uh, sometimes, you know, I mean, it, it, some, there are projects when architects come first and conservators come later. And then, you know, then, then there will be always a kind of uh, uh, not able to connect with each other, what other has done and what damages occurred. So a project such as always good when you work with an architect and work along with and, you know, solve the problems, which will definitely come in any site uh, together. So this was one of the success stories. You know, if you look at the uh, artifacts inside, they are amazing. You know, this is uh, one of the rarest uh, form of mandalas inside this temple, the only one in the Western Himalayas. And, you know, there also they had this uh, uh, custom of lighting lamps inside. So, you know, st instead of telling them to stop, to uh, stop lighting the lamps, we asked them, you know, could you please uh, light the lamps outside, light the lamps inside, a very limited one. And, you know, the more, the, uh, the, more the larger number of lamps you light in a different room outside. So Ajay made a different room with, with the uh, permission of the community and, you know, and the lamps were lighted outside, which definitely helps the monument. But my point is that the temple building and the decorative art forms are equally important. And that is how when a collaborative project, when you understand with each other, when you work with each other and uh, solve problems with each other can be a very successful effort. Uh, 
sometimes you know when you come to sites also you have to deal with the community and it can be sites where there are very where, which are open to public i mean almost all of them are open to public but uh, sometimes there are a lot of issues like retouching repainting and that is sometimes when you uh, deal with the uh, stakeholders villagers uh, and the community itself so this is a particular example of caves of uh, saspol in ladakh where we are having a meeting with the uh, secretary and monks of the likir monastery uh, intact uh, who has been working with uh, intact ladakh who has been working with us in collaboration in the project and the village of saspol where we were discussing and deciding what to do but the point here is that also something that we don't learn in schools is that how to deal with the community because today you work and you move out and uh, then there is a younger generation that has to understand what has happened on the site why it is why it is important what why uh, what, what are we actually doing doing on the site and why we are doing that so something like that uh, so social programs is it would be extremely useful for the projects and uh, that is how the, the what, what we want some in a way of validating the success of the pro, uh, success of the program and ensuring that you know these uh, amazing art artworks invaluable artworks will continue for the future uh, so uh, before uh, you, i mean it's on the screen now uh, what what you learn on site with dance architects and all and now i think uh, it is time that you know benny will uh, deal in detail with a uh, lot of uh, in situ and understandings that he had in his work and what he has experienced and his experience is tremendous is one of the most senior uh, conservation architects of the country so let me hand it over to benny for this thank you uh, thanks sriyuma uh, i will uh, start my presentation okay now i mean uh, thanks sanjay for giving me an opportunity to talk but uh, Uh, so i'm suggesting that it is mostly the youngsters crowd so that is why i chose this uh, topic uh, what you don't learn in conservation schools there are many things which they don't teach and uh, so i just thought so i am not talking from any of the books or any of the uh, uh, blogs or there are books written what you don't hundred and one things you don't learn in architecture school there are some books like that i'm not talking about any of these uh, any of these things uh, uh, so see when i took my masters in conservation in 1987 and came back to india i was one of the early persons to win the charles valles trust and took the mas so i took this masters degree from the university of york uh, so i was one of the first person at that time there were no conservation courses in india the only thing which indians had exposure was to go to ipro micro used to do, do a 9 month certificate course in italy in rome some people have taken that course from the archaeological survey or from some others have taken but there was no proper degree courses in india or uh, somebody was uh, so the the charles valleys and the british council and the intact together started the scholarship so i went to uk learned there took my masters came back and uh, when you come back i mean you had to start from scratch there were hardly any projects from the private sector i am saying non asi sector i mean nobody used to think about conservation if anybody had heard about conservation it was mostly conservation of energy or environmental conservation the building conservation or the urban conservation the way we see it now nobody had tried to do it so i had to learn everything from scratch i did not know how to make a an a proper estimate because the estimate that you make because you need an estimate to plan for the cons uh, conservation works and uh, the way you do it is very different from the way you do for a new building new building is standard the engineers also didn't know did not know how to do it because so it was like learning from scratch so i had to there was nobody i mean there were, i could not work with anybody and i had to start the practice of my own so uh, uh, everything was learning from the field there were no examples which could be followed so i might have committed a lot of mistakes in the in this process because there was no 
reports I could follow. What most of the reports which I followed, wrote, I did at that time were some of the first reports made on conservation in India. Now, when I look back at those reports, I find there are so many drawbacks, so many mistakes, etc. Because I came back in 87, 88, 89, 90, 91, etc. I used to work for Intact. So Intact used to say that this project coming up, can you make a report on it? Can you make some estimates on it? That's how I started. But after that, some time I was tired of doing reports because what is the point in doing reports and reports and reports when nothing happens in the field? So you, 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 you get into frustration in one way. Of course, there are still many officers who work only on reports, but that was the time. And many of the reports which are made it in, in the late 80s, the work was carried out 10 years later, 15 years later, and all those things. So, so it, it is not that nothing. So it was a new field. Uh, so you had to, uh, as I said, you had to learn a lot of mistakes from the, from the thing. Now, so what I'm going to talk today is not from the bookish knowledge. So I will say conservation architect or a conservation consultant is like a building doctor. Because when a, there's a normal allopathic doctor, the patients can speak. Here the patients do not speak. So you have to make your judgments. You have to prescribe what is the remedial measures required where the buildings doesn't speak to you. I'm putting it in inverted commas uh, like that. So you have to make the building speak. That is one of the primary things which you have to do. And uh, after I started working on it, one of the things I learned, uh, you see, uh, one major handicap of mine was that I don't have a degree in architecture. I had done civil engineering, and but I never worked as a civil engineer also. I worked with Laurie Baker who never had an office. So I worked at his, at his site. I worked with him for less than a year. And then I did some buildings. Some people asked me to do so. I designed and constructed some of the buildings in the initial period. So one of the first things which I learned is that there is a huge, huge gap between what is the bookish knowledge and what is actually happening in the site or the traditional knowledge which people have. Bookish knowledge is something which anybody can, if you read a book and thoroughly, you get the bookish knowledge. But the knowledge that you get from talk, working with the craftsman, working with the ordinary man, working in the field is something which makes you very, so what I'm now today, is mainly from the experiences which I've done. I've learned a lot of things I learned. As I said, I made a lot of mistakes when I look back. So you learn from mistakes. As a professional, the important thing that you have to do uh, is to see that you will also make mistakes, but repeated mistakes don't make it. A mistake is not something which is bad. I, I don't think it cannot be called a failure. failure. You try, try, and again, finally, you will reach at the answer. And that is that is what. So I've learned many, many of the things by, but I learned tremendously from the traditional knowledge, which helped me tremendous, uh, quite a bit in designing new buildings the way I have done. I mean, because now my practice, 50% is conservation, 50% is new buildings. So the knowledge I gained by working in the field in conservation I applied it in the new buildings because many of this conservation work was not happening at that time, but now things have changed. Now there is not properly qualified people to do proper conservation work. We are not able to take all the projects which comes into, uh, uh, comes into our, I mean, there are a lot of inquiries coming, but we are not able to take it. Now, as a young conservation architect or anything, uh, it is very important to have knowledge about historic buildings, about vernacular architecture, about traditional building materials like lime, timber, and all those things. And many of these things are not taught in the conventional engineering courses or architecture schools. Uh, but don't think seeing a building in a bad shape, don't think that it is something which is very difficult to learn. It's something which is of very higher knowledge and higher capacity. 
you will require the kind of costly equipment or the expertise of a highly learned specialized structural engineer only in the case of five or ten percent of the buildings 90 percent of the buildings is you will be able to tackle with your basic knowledge i mean that uh, engineering knowledge or architectural knowledge which you have but i'm not talking about the knowledge that you learned from books and and it's a, if you want to design a new building it is very easy to design a new building you can just make a drawing put a roof give it to a structural engineer he will put the beams and structures and slabs and you can construct a new building a contractor will be able to construct a new building but in the case of the repairing or the restoration or the conservation of a historic building it is not possible to do engineers in many cases they have never dealt with any of these traditional building materials like lime or timber or even earth they have not they also not learn architects are also architects also don't learn in their courses the knowledge is very limited and this is where your learning experience working with the craftsmen becomes very very important and let me tell you although i took my degree in civil engineering i never learned anything while i was a student of civil engineering i just managed to pass or take a degree i'm not saying that uh, you should do the same as if you are a student but i had to do it i did it because um, i did, didn't like the subject quite a bit so but when i started practicing conservation i found that many of these things which you learned in many of these uh, colleges or schools became very very important i think if you want to be a very good successful conservation architect or a conservation thing all the physics chemistry or maths that you learn in the fifth standard to eighth standard is more than enough i mean even just removing the ninth standard and tenth standard you don't need calculus you don't need uh, many of these trigonometry i mean trigonometry or many of these things you don't require any of these things all that you need simple physics chemistry and maths is what you need to look at many of these buildings or solve many of these problems is what is enough there might be some special cases where you need expertise at that time you consult an expert even now i don't do structural design i if i have something i call a art conservatory if something which is there or if we cannot i mean the project doesn't allow you to hire an art conservator you just leave it for the future generation to deal with it so you don't require much of a high high higher knowledge or so don't think that um uh, when you look at a historic building as a conservation architect you need to know all these complex formulas i don't think you need to do so many lab tests or you don't need complicated equipments in 5 person or 10 person it will be necessary and in most of the cases which i have learned i have not uh, i have i have not used it i mean i didn't put the leaning tower of pisa where which is leaning uh, i mean these are two i mean it's uh, again two towers in a, a small italian city called bologna and uh, there are two towers each of the rich families in the 16 17 this that they used to build towers and building the towers was a kind of symbol of uh, just like now people build various towers and uh, complexes in many of the cities there they, it was a system so they used to build these towers and each one built a higher one than the previous one and say mine is the tallest in the city these were the two towers it is not a i mean a photograph which is both are leaning i mean leaning towards each other but the structure has not fallen and it is standing there for I a mean, leaning tower of Pisa is standing there i don't want to go into the how the linear the simple rule of a leaning building is very simple if the center of gravity falls outside the base of the structure then only it will collapse that's the kind of, this is the six standard physics that you learn so a leaning building you should not think seeing a crack you should not get alarmed seeing a building leaning i mean i'm just giving this leaning tower these buildings are leaning for hundreds of years and still standing it will fall if the center of gravity falls outside so a little bit outward leaning wall or many of these things to go to amsterdam city i didn't put the photograph there are many buildings which are leaning because they have been built on a, a, a canal thing reclamation reclaimed land and some of them they say to take the furniture into the thing the building has to lean outward so some people do it on a conscious manner now the problem of conservation many of the people can say conservation architect which i also faced at one point of my time was 
you don't know whether it is going to people if a building comes to you saying the building is in a bad shape the walls are leaning outward there is a crack in the building not one crack they say there are multiple cracks in the building you call an engineer structural engineer specialized engineer and he doesn't use any of the engineering which he has, he has studied in his college or anywhere he just comes and says oh there are cracks why do you want to retain the building demolish and construct a new building and he will say this in front of the client also and he is a learned specialist so this is one of the things which you do. and they will, when you ask them some question they will say the torsion is like this bending stress is like this the modulus rupture i have never understood any of these terms i still don't know what is the meaning of these terms i don't know but they try to confuse you but i work with the structural engineers i tell them of course the building is leaning but what is the way you can retain the building i show them examples where buildings have been retained so i say this crack how to stitch the crack and they will always go with the easiest solution this is very human in nature you are asked to design a building you will design the easiest way because you save a lot of time on doing when they give a solution ask them what is the second option i know i don't want this because this will not go with the building what is the second option because this is that this is because the problem with the many of the consultants that you work with service engineers and uh, all these people because when you come into practice you need to work with all these people uh, you have to work with the air conditioning people you have to work with the electrical consultant uh, plumbing consultant the problem with all these people they don't understand the aesthetics of the building and they don't understand the value of a historic building so our second as a conservation architect or a conservation consultant it is your job to tell them no this is not there are cases when i had to work with the engineers i that they have sent me a structural design i refused saying that this will not go with the building why don't you think about an alternative i send it back they do the calculation again and submit again we send it back this has happened four times five times depending on that but once you start working with a sympathetic structural engineer or a sympathetic air conditioning consultant then things will change drastically so it is very very important so don't get scared as a youngster i'm just thinking you are 24 years old when you have to do i mean many of the projects of some of the things when i did when i came back from uk i was 25 years old so i started dealing with historic buildings at the age of 26 without anybody under anybody's supervision so i had to deal i knew that the decisions are making or uh, is uh, uh, is far reaching and i want to conserve the historic character and the features and all these things so just don't take them i am saying that even now at this age 30 years after more than 30 years of experience in conservation i don't overrule the decision of a structural engineer because he is a specialist who has learned it but many cases i don't agree i say no this is not acceptable why don't you do this so this way we work and make them make them do now when you study architecture or i mean most of you would have studied architecture uh you, the way you study is a little bit problematic i mean you, i think you are many of the people don't study it in a proper manner now what is the way which which are many of many of the things what is the way you should do i would like to bring in the word intuition here and what is intuition this is the oxford dictionary meaning the ability to know something by using your feelings rather than considering the facts so you know you don't do any calculations you don't know how to do calculation because you are not a structural engineer you are not a air conditioning you don't you don't know many of these things how how the things behave because you are not supposed to you are not studied these things you are not a specialist on this but you should have an intuition on the buildings and this is a quality that you cultivate in you over a period of time so all these 30 years or 35 years i have developed a quality of intuition in me over this it it comes with experience with more and more more and more. i'll come to that a little bit later more and more so it is the ability to know something by having you have you should have a feeling that this is the way to go about it and i think my success is because my intuition it is not scientific it is not proven by any formula 
but it is an intuition. You get a feeling out of it. And you have to get this. If you have to be a successful conservation architect, you have to have this intuition. Now, let me just try to explain what is intuition. Now, my grandmother, I mean, this is a, a picture I've taken from the internet, but my grandmother used to cook food. And the curries which she makes were amazingly tasty. And each time she makes the same fish curry, it will have a slightly different taste. But every time it tastes excellent. And if you, I mean, the way she adds salt to it, she takes the bottle and adds it. She even doesn't take even a teaspoon and adds salt. She doesn't even take, when she wants to add chili, she doesn't take a teaspoon and add it. Everything. I'm sure it doesn't look like a recipe book or cookery book and add the ingredients. This is an intuition which she has developed over the years. Cooking, the best chefs have an intuition how to do the best cook. I know when we got married, my wife, we got married, my wife used to do cooking. I mean, she has to look at a cookery book and take two teaspoons of this, one glass of, if she wants to make a cake, one glass of sugar, like that, or half a glass of butter, or 100 ml of butter. So this is the way it happened. But my grandmother, when she used to cook, she never used to cook. This is intuition. All of our best craftsmen in our thing had this intuition. They did not go to any architecture school. They did not go to anything, but they had this intuition of how to do the, do the thing. So this intuition is very important in which you have to develop. Thing. I will give you two examples of how this intuition is to be done. And if, when you were in plus one, you would have learned in applied mechanics or even physics that a ladder has to be leaned against a wall. A person with 60 kilogram is climbing the wall. What angle the ladder is to be kept? I mean, this is one exercise. If you have studied physics in the 11th standard or 12th standard, you learned this. Because this is a standard problem which is given. How to, what angle a ladder is to be leaned against? Now you ask a 10 year old child and ask him to climb, he knows what angle it has to be put. He doesn't have to do this calculation and say 25 degrees is the angle in which it has to be put or 30 degrees is the angle which has to be This is intuition. He knows very well. All these layman workers who works at the site, they know if they ask them to climb up a wall, they will lean the wall properly without any knowledge of physics, any knowledge of, this is what they do. A river, a person who is row rowing, taking you from one and one south end of the river to the north end, or across Ganges, for example. And the river is flowing at such a velocity, and this boat is going at such a velocity. And he knows if he wants to reach the opposite side, which direction he has to go. But if you study, you have to do, you have to look at your physics. The river is flowing with so much velocity. You are going at such this angle, you have to draw a parallelogram, find out the result, and, and this is what you do. This is so this intuition. You don't you don't need to know, you don't need to know the formulas, but if you want to be a successful conservation architect, you need to have this intuition. This intu this is very important. I'll give you one more example and then get into the next point. You know, in India, in India, every child or anybody knows that if two strings are tied between two posts, it will sag. Intuition tells you that the string will sag. But if you want to know how much it will sag, then you have to go into your third semester strength of materials class, which will say a uniformly distributed load, simply supported at two ends, uniformly be distributed load of 60 kilogram per meter or what is the string, a uh, dead load you have to calculate, live load you have to calculate, and then you have to, I don't know the formula, but WL by eight will be the deflection, which will run into 3.003 centimeters. And if you want to calculate the bending moment, WL square by eight, this is what you do. But a child also knows that if two strings are tied and there is a dead weight of the string will make it sad. And this is intuition. And if you know how this happens with the blade, I just gave three examples. And this is something which cannot be easily be taught. You have to develop this experience over the years by seeing one building after the other. And as I said earlier, buildings do not speak. It is like uh, when allopathic doctors, when they, they can ask, is there a pain here? When did the pain start coming? 
did you have pain three months ago or is the pain coming is the fever coming only at night so all these things an allopathic doc doctor can talk to a patient and do it is it is not like at least in the pediatrician he can touch and then the child will cry but it is uh, in our case we can't do even a veterinary doctor will be able to we are in a much better position he can he can touch and at least the 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 cow or the dog will <laughs> produce some sound whether he whether it pains at that particular position or not buildings doesn't speak and this is our problem so we need to develop this intuition the best doctors are also those who have the intuition intuition intuitive qualities in them in this is this is this is very this is very very important now as a conservation architect the other important thing what you have to look at is that there is a difference between seeing and observing you see a building but you have to observe a building i tell all my youngsters who are, you have to scan every square centimeter of the building you to scan every square inch or square centimeter of the building you might be looking at it there are many people everybody comes and everybody looks at the building but some people don't see the cracks you have to see the cracks you see any writing or you see an interference which have been made 20 years ago or 50 years ago all these things so you have to observe and this is again another quality which is very 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 important you will see archaeological evidence you will see changes which have been made 75 years ago you might ask some questions and this this is this is very very important for you to come to a thing you should have a good knowledge about the uh, techniques materials but uh, uh, this is this one this this is also very important now before you just get to be to be a successful cons conservation architect you should have a very good understanding of the building which is very very important you should have the right understanding of the building there will be 10 architects or 10 conservation architects go only two will have the right and right understanding is in course right understanding about the building many people will see you are qualified you get it but you should have the right understanding this right is a judgment which you have to, which you have to which which will. if you have the right understanding about the building then you will be successful as a conservation architect the solutions that you suggest or the remedial measures that you suggest will automatically come to you and this is very important and different people see the same building in different ways this is very very natural for people to happen depending on their prior experience the way they look at the building the uh, the, the, the perception the way they look at this will be different my advice to you is that if you if when you deal with a historic building be in love with the building love the building it is very very important to love the building that you are going to i'm not saying you should go and hug it that's not what i mean you just try to understand the building and say that my job is to conserve this building and if you are able to conserve you are doing a noble thing rather than destruction destruction is never constructive destruction is a bad thing to be done unless it is of a such a kind of emergency so different people see the building in different ways this is one of the examples which i do when a god you see a god like this i am showing a picture of a god if a butcher sees the god immediately what comes to his mind will be oh it weighs 100 kg if i cut it and sell it next sunday in the market 100 kg of what i'll be able to get 60 kg of meat and if i sell it at this price i'll make so much profit it is very very natural that a person thinks like that a butcher because that is his background this the way you you have to look at things is different whereas there are other people who are got lovers you see a dog and you love the dog there are so many people who love the street dogs many of you will also be loving the street dogs i'm sure uh would so you see the street dog in a different way whereas others will see a street dog as somebody something to be killed uh, by the i mean somebody something to be caught care caught by the corporation people and dumped somewhere so each people sees things in a in a different way this is the photograph of the oldest teak tree and if you just look at this tree if a carpenter sees it what comes to his mind will be very different he will say this is of such a large girth the girth is written i'll be able to make a dining table for eight people without joints 
I will get a plank from the center, which is very wide. And as a, if it's a timber merchant, he will think very differently. He will think that if I cut this tree, I mean, I can charge the price, exorbitant price, because there is no tree which is as big as this, where you can take the wide planks and you can make, you can make anything with it. So I'll be able to make a lot of money, get extra profit, uh, or profit out of the tree. That's the way. Whereas an environmentalist will look. You see a tree which has given, I mean, it has been a house for so many birds and insects and living beings in this world. I mean, it has been living in this world for say 300 years or 500 years. What a, this thing, what a beautiful tree it is. Okay. There will be others who will think, no, you need two people to hug the tree. Too. So there are various people which will look at each of these things. I'm just saying that each of the people will look at perception, what they see things in a completely different way. And that is, that is, what, uh, that is what, uh, what becomes very, very important. If a, for example, a tree cutter, if you ask somebody, a tree cutter, a person who regularly cuts the tree, you ask him to come, he will not have any thinking of the environmentally sensitive person. He will not think like the timber merchant that it will bring in so much money and profit. He will not think like the carpenter. What he will think, if I cut this tree, how can I make sure that it doesn't fall over other trees or it doesn't fall over another building? Shall I fell towards the south direction or the northeast direction or the northwest direction? So he, his thinking process is very different. And unless you develop a thinking process when you see a historic building, which is pro-conservation, you are, that is why I said you have to love the old buildings or historic buildings. We need to, need to know how, how it is. I've just put a building which you have conserved about two years ago and uh, before conservation, after conservation. If this building, the building on the left, if a timber merchant, demolition contractor comes, he will see, oh, there are so much uh, timber I can make, I can get and so much the insects or termites have come. So I might not be able to get so many cubic feet. I will have to take a risk allowance. So I will consider 30% will be eaten by termites, only 70% So his, his thinking process is uh, very different. So he will try to look at things in a, in a completely different way. Whereas archaeologists might look at it from an archaeological point of view. And if an art conservator comes, he will look at the carvings, he will look at the details, he will look at how can I, or there might be some vegetable painted detailing in the building. So he will look at things in that perspective where a conservation architect's perspective will be different. And if an engineer comes, I mean, who is not in tune with this, he will say, let me demolish this building. Why do you want to retain this building? So this is the way each one looks at a building, but conservation is becoming more and more popular. We need many times more conservation architects and consultants in this country. There will not be any shortage of work for any of the people if you approach the building and the profession in a in the right way. Now, uh, see, many will say that the building is unsafe. You have to demolish. I have gone and rescued or conserved many buildings where the engineers and other architects are saying that the building is unsafe. This will be the case with anybody who is working in conservation for at least five years. And in 99% or 95%, it will be easy to conserve the building. And it will be economically viable, at least in 90% cases, unless the roof is heavily damaged. If the roof and the foundation and the walls are reasonably in good condition, the build, it is much more economical to conserve a building. You will be able to do with the calculations, you will be able to convince. We have been able to convince many of our clients, many of the clients that I want to build a new building. We, I, we ask them, what is that? He says that there is an old building which I want to demolish. We, there are few cases where we have been able to convince the client to retain the old building. And they are quite happy living in those old buildings uh, uh, the way it is. So the old building has its own value, which is very, very important. Now as a conservation architect, the important thing is that you start doing the work. You as an youngster, it might be a small project that you will be doing. You, 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 the experience that you that will be in. There is a way in which, in my village, the people are taught swimming in a particular way. 
that is it's not the way i mean my son has learned swimming in a, in a swimming pool with the with the help of a swimming pool coach what is done in our village is to put a 5 year old a 6 year old child just put them into water and given a floating thing which is nothing but a banana stem so you just which floats in water so you have to do all those things in water and that's how you learn that's how you learn it might be a crude way of learning so the my advice will be learning from the craftsman once you learn from the craftsman you are getting a knowledge which nobody else has so if you have 10 years of working with the craftsman working in the field working on a project you gain knowledge which nobody else has got even knowledge is worth this is my success thing the knowledge which i have gained over all these years is what i have gained from the craftsman so i don't have to need to have any fear or get uh, from anywhere nobody can now I mean, because i have struggled for gaining that knowledge and it's important that that we pass on that knowledge to the next generation which is what we are now trying to do it in the office and learning from the craftsman made a turning point in my career this is what we did this is one of the earlier photographs you can see me sitting in the middle uh, i mean the black more uh, dark brown pan and dark brown shirt i was very lean at that point of time along with some workers and there were two engineers who were supervising the construction uh, we, were, we just took a group photograph this photograph might have been taken more than 30 years ago so learning from the craftsman you see craftsman each craftsman each head carpenter head mason or anybody they knows awful lot of things which nobody knows which is not taught to you in your conservation or architecture school he knows things but a mason or a carpenter or a stone carver doesn't know that it is knowledge for you it is knowledge for him it is not knowledge he has learned it from passing on from generation to generation or somebody senior mason to him might have taught him he doesn't consider it as knowledge because he has not studied he doesn't have a certificate of uh, as a uh, this thing but he knows an awful lot of things i'll give one small incident which is there see we uh, when i was studying in york university we had classes being taken by mason see we are i am doing my masters in conservation not once there were times when masons had come and given to take on classes for us and there were two professors in my class i mean they have already teaching but they wanted to take additional degree because conservation was i'm talking about the 18 86 87 with these two one from canada and one from us two professors and they just came to get that extra knowledge in conservation which is becoming popular and popular you have to understand that even in europe conservation became a specialized field mostly in the 60s 70s and 70s and 80s so we are not very lagging behind but now in europe and the us etc it has become part of the mainstream i mean it is not considered to be a highly specialized field there are most of these conventional architectural firms employs conservation architects also and most of the people have taken architects working in uk they have taken courses they have become expert they did not they don't again they don't have a masters in conservation but they have taken short term courses and they have improved their knowledge in conservation they know how to deal with uh, historic buildings or anything so we had these masons coming so one of the there was a great greek, greek architect he is now a professor in one of the uk colleges a great architect tanas is his name so he came and asked our director in a in a informal chat why are you asking these masons to come and take classes for these architects and professors i mean most of whom had multiple years of experience our director's answers was very simple he said you might have degrees and masters and doctorates but there are things which masons know and you don't know so that's why we want masons to take you can't imagine a mason coming and taking a class even for a diploma in architecture course this is the state of affairs so you have to learn and you have to learn these are things which you will learn in the field and this is very very important for you to pick up this knowledge otherwise you are losing a great opportunity my success is i say as i said earlier i don't have a degree in architecture i did not learn any civil engineering while i studied my course i was a more or less like a drop out i had very i have some of the lowest marks in records 
for some of the papers, but I managed to pass. This all this thing is because I learned things once I came into the field, and I learned things from the masons, from, from the carpenters, and from the craftsmen, from the work superintendent, from the supervisors, from other engineers, from other architects. All these things is what finally the answer. Don't think that with your bookish knowledge you will be able to overcome or you will be able to supervise many of these people. It's impossible to uh, do some of these things. So just be. Uh, that is that 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 is very important. There is one more incident I'll give you. Uh, in while I was studying in UK, we had a class taken by again by a mason. The mason was taking a class uh, on what kind of tools to be used under what circumstance. You might have seen. I mean, in UK, it's the situation here also. If it is a good mason, he will have five different kinds of trowels. A yeah, carpenter will have twenty different kinds of chisels and each chisel is to be used for a particular reason, particular time. It is not that he is carrying all these five trowels and uh, 20 carpenter carrying 20 chisels. There is a particular requirement for it. So this mason was giving up. In UK because of the highly specialized nature of the decorative masonry work and the pointing of the brickwork, they are more tools. So this mason was asked to give a class uh, to us uh, in uh, trying to, as, as I told earlier, not once or twice, we had many classes by people who doesn't have any degree in architecture or degree in civil engineering in our master's course. And the York course, when I did it, it was considered to be of the highest grade in UK. And we had students from 17 countries. We had students from Canada and uh, US also. So this is such a reputed course. So it is not a small course. They, they are not trying to save a money. Instead of calling an architect, they're calling a mason. So this mason is giving explanation. What tool used to be used under what time? So for one work, you will use one tool first. Then after some time, you use another tool. Then you use a third tool. All these things he was trying to explain to us in the field. And this is what the mason was doing. At the end of the class, we are, one, of our, one of our friends, one of my classmates had a doubt. And uh, the next class is to, to be taken by the superintending architect of the English heritage, the number two head in English heritage, which is the equivalent to our archaeological survey of India. So he, so he came 10 minutes early, so he just happens to sit there and he has taken classes for us earlier. So we knew him, John Archers, he has written books, Bricks, uh, bricks in Conservation, Pla Renders, Plasters in Conservation. And he has written a few books on conservation, which are standard test books for any student across the world. So John Archer came, he was sitting in the audience and one of, our, the, uh, one of my classmates had a doubt, he stood up and asked the doubt. You see, the way we ask questions, he, one of the architect in my class asked the doubt towards Archer. The mason was giving the class, the question is regarding the tools, but he was asking the question to the superintending architect. This was what was happening. And John Archers, he stood up, he answered the question. I mean, you have to see, the other is a mason or a much lower in the English heritage or career. John Archers is the number two. And he, John Archers answered the question. After he answered the question, he turned towards the mason and he said, Mr. Jenks, am I right? No senior architect of our state, of our country, or anybody, any supporting architect will not dare to uh, dare to ask such a thing. Even they will not do it to an assistant engineer or assistant architect who is a junior architect. They will not do. I mean, this is the kind of thing. So your attitude has to change. So you once you start learning from these masters and craftsmen and this thing, it's very important important to do. And also, it's very very important to learn about details. See, in conservation work, in new buildings, there are standard details. So if you have to give a drawing for a joinery, for example, because I do new buildings as well, you just give the elevation of the joinery and some groove details. You don't have to know about, strictly speaking, how the joint is to be made. You don't give the details what number of screws to be used. You don't give the details of the hinges to be used, but abroad they give, it, give all these details with the part numbers and all those things. So there are so many details which are missing in the in our our details. We, we call it detailed drawings in many of them, but I have worked on an international project when I had to, we had to do the same thing. We had to give even the screw number, what uh, the part number, because screws, various numbers are there. 
so you have to specify the number of this i mean not the i mean six numbers seven number eight number 10 number uh, nine number so all these numbers similarly the sand papers that you use you have different 50 60 uh, 120 uh, like that various numbers are available for each of these uh, sand papers so all these details it is very very important for you to know it yes. because when you do a conservation project all these details matter in a new building this doesn't matter so the right kind of sand papers has to be used That's, i mean i mean you have to know because it becomes your responsibility becomes much more because the conventional architects and masons because now masons most of the masons who come doesn't know how to use line for example when i started my career in conservation there were plenty of masons who knew it was very easy to work with line there were masons who knew line how to use line now you have it might be line might be still be used in work in uh, in the villages perhaps for example but the, the the way the cement industry all these cement companies are advertised i mean the strength of the pump and bridge and the, i mean the kind of advertisement they give it in the tvs even the villager thinks that cement is the ultimate in material to be used i mean the building will get strength only if they use so all these kind of things which has happened but as a conservation architect it is very very important for you to get uh, get to know the details so i'm just showing this detail how the lime and sand is mixed and beaten up very traditional process this is when we did one project conservation of one building where we had to lay lime mortar and uh, the building might be 100 years old and uh, the backyard of the building the one of the workers told, told me that among the backyard the same stone which has been where the lime mortar was ground in the olden days while making the building is available. So you can see that curve. It is a granite stone. How much, I mean, it's a 55,000 square feet building which we had to conserve. So we can just imagine how much to make the entire line to be ground in a fine ground. So the amount of grinding, so that is why the stone has taken the shape. And we, we so as soon as they came to, they came and told me, I said, just take the same stone and use the same process in making the line mortar. Now, one of the things that you have to understand in conservation is that wrong repairs will do more harm than doing good. I can give hundreds of examples, but I don't want to do give, I mean, because of the time is limited, I'm not planning to give quite a bit. I, I will just wind it up in less than 10 minutes, but it is very, very important. Uh, that, and conventional engineers, conventional architects, conventional supervisors doesn't know about these things. I'll just give one example. For example, this is a building where the rising dampness, where the salt water rises by capillary action, and the lower part gets damaged. They plaster that. The damage shifts to the next. I mean, you can see the layers of plaster. You can see in the photograph how the different layers of plaster. Again, now the upper layer is plaster. They will again plaster it. The water will rise further, still further. So not knowing what is the, exactly the remedial measures which should be taken, the treatment is being prescribed. The old buildings, the historic buildings has to be dealt in a different way. Unfortunately, the engineering or the architectural education doesn't give them that expertise. So that is why I said many of these things which you have to learn. I mean, there might be many things which might be taught to you in the, in the conservation, specialized conservation courses, but uh, there might be still many things which are not in. So there are many cases where the wrong repairs cause uh, wrong problems. And wrong di diagnosis happens in many cases. Simple reason goes with the wrong di diagnosis and wrong remedy is suggested. Then you have to go and repair it. I've just done many projects where I'm called in to do at the, at, at the, at the last minute. So you, the best thing is to try to look at, try to look at all the possibilities. I normally say, I mean, I mean, if you have any of you have seen Hitchcock movies, the way the detective or the Sherlock, how the evidences are coming. You look at various evidence. You don't find out who is the murderer at the beginning of the movie. You will know only after two hours of watching the movie how the evidences are. Been, or you, you have to do inquiries. This is the same process. Don't jump into conclusions. Look at various possibilities. Oh, no, this is not. 
just check whether the the problem is happening only during the rainy season if it is happening only at rainy season then it is something might be something to do with the rains if it doesn't happen during the rainy season there might not be something to do with the rains and you just check when it started happening so whether it happened started happening i can give so many examples but because of the lack of the time i'm not giving examples but just if you don't know something don't recommend a wrong remedial measures it is much more problematic for uh, people who have to deal with such a thing and don't treat symptoms i mean this was a damage i mean people thought it is the uh, it is the lime plaster which is damage uh, not good that is why they apply a strong cement mortar you see they have not learned i mean I, this is not one place you would have seen many cases like i have seen hundreds of examples where they just you have the dampness they think it is with because of the lime they apply cement again the problem becomes more serious or the problem might be disappearing for 6 months or one or two years again it is it appears again so don't do any so just try don't jump into conclusions this is why i said that it is very important to have higher knowledge as far as the uh, when you practice it very very important now i just try to drive one principle i mean this is the only thing other thing is mostly there but many people don't understand what durability is of a building many people think that the building will last for see when i started my career if you ask how many years that like 30 years ago if you ask a question how many years a concrete building will last people will say 200 years or 300 years because we didn't have the experience but now if you ask anybody if they will say the concrete roofs will last only for 50 years or 75 75 years is the maximum i hear from people when i go to a seminar and ask them the question they say max there are people who say 30 years it will last 40 years it will last so if it lasts for 75 years why do you design buildings why do you learn about the technology which lasts only for 75 years why do our architecture schools and civil engineering course colleges teach about concrete and steel when they know that these buildings are going to last only for 75 years whereas we know very well these traditional buildings have lasted for 100 years 200 years and 300 years so there is a lack of awareness on durability as a conservation architect it is very very important for anybody to know how what durability means i am just making some statements none of the building materials increase in strength over a period of time you learn in college that cement mortar the more longer the period it is exposed the lime mortar also longer the period is exposed then it develops strength that means a concrete slab which does if you check the strength on 30 days and check it after one year the strength is more if you check it after three years the strength of a concrete slab is more this is except for the mortar or anything to do with cement and lime anything no metalling materials increase in strength over a period of time at the same time a building which is exposed to the weather is constantly decaying that is why we say in museum conditions all these art conservators will know it much better to for materials not to decay we have to control the relative humidity to say 50% the temperature has to be controlled to say 20 or 24 degree but i can't keep a building in a, under the museum conditions so building is exposed to sun building is exposed to rain so it is supposed to decay but generally once the necessary quality of the building materials is reasonably good there are two factors which affect the durability of the building one is the workmanship if the workmanship is bad the building will not last if a concrete roof is leaking up the end of one year it is not because proper cement has not been added it is because the workmanship the quality of workmanship has come down the design details is very important many of our traditional buildings the way they design things the design details were good these were some of the basic things in construction in architecture but many of the modern people don't know now i'll just give one example the plaster gets flaked off i mean this is one of the very common reasons the plaster flaking off from the the loses its adhesion from the background one is that if there is dampness inside then the plaster will flake off the cement plaster or lime plaster is dampness because there might be a plumbing line inside water might be entering to a crack on the outside then what you see is that the plastering will flake off 
and finishing coat is stronger than under coat. That is why uh, they say the each of the coach. Uh, that is why people say that you should not apply too strong a cement mortar onto a surface. If you have the, that is why one of the reasons why the cement plaster doesn't stick to a mud wall, earth wall, because when you apply a strong material onto a weak background, then it also it will fail. And it's also very important that before you apply the plaster, you have to wet the materials very, 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 very correctly. Because otherwise, water is required for the setting of the cement. So if the water is absorbed by the background material, then the cement will not be able to attain the strength, so it will start decaying much, much faster. So this is another reason why it is that excessive thickness of coat. So if you have to, the water wall is very regular, masons know very well, they apply the plaster in two coats or three coats. Inadequate key in backing, the surface should be very rough when you apply the plaster. That's why you can't apply, that is why they hack it and make the surface rougher. Sometimes when you do the concreting, the concreting will become very smooth, the plaster will not stay. So mason knows it very well, they hack it. So they, with a chisel or a hammer or anything, they hack it and make it rough and then they apply. So if you look at that, most of these things depend on workmanship and not on the material quality. So many of the defects or the durability depends on the uh, quality of workmanship is what is coming. A building with bad workmanship will not be durable. That is why many of the concrete buildings built few years ago become. It is not the fault of the concrete that the building is not durable. It is the fault of the way in which the building has been built. And also the design details are very important. Flat roofs are not suitable for high rainfall climate. Exposed brickwork, we know buildings last for a long time. Plaster is not a protective coating. Uh, it is a protective coating in the sense that uh, uh, exposed brickwork, if you do pointing properly, the exposed brickwork on it will, it will last for a long time. And it will last for a long time. Also, it is very clear now that plastering can never be done faultless. And many of the places where the plastering is done, it cracks. And you see some of the buildings built 30 years ago, the buildings is in a very bad shape. Because when you, cement is very brittle. Cement doesn't have elasticity. Where lime mortar is more elastic and not brittle. So when you apply a cement plaster, the more stronger it is, the more cracks are likely to come. So when you have the cracks, water will enter through these cracks over a period of time. And water enters and that, that is where it is happened, uh, where, where the durability of the plaster is affected. Every material expands and contracts every day. Daytime temperature is 40, nighttime temperature is 20. So you know coefficient of thermal expansion which you study in school. The concrete slab expands during daytime. At night, it contracts. Again, next day, it expands. Next day, it contracts. That is why a building which is well built, there was no leak for 30 years, but after 30 years, the leak starts appearing. Because this expansion and contraction every year is adding to the leakage problem, which creates. So I'm just trying to, I'm not trying to do, but I'm just trying to tell that the workmanship is very important. The materials is exposed to heavy rain and sun, which is also something. There is no factor in building construction, building design, which says you don't design a building for 50 years, you don't design a building for 100 years. The way you look after a building, the way you conserve a building, the way you maintain a building. So even an earth building, if you have the proper detailing, it can last forever. And uh, one of the reasons is that workmanship is given very low priority, but in conservation, workmanship is very, very important. Now the society pays for quantity, not quality. A good mason, if he does good brickwork, he doesn't get it. The, the contractor pays the mason according to the number of bricks he has laid. They don't want to have the durability for the building. They want only the durability of the building only till they get the final payment. This is the way it is there. So they, they know that even if you do a bad quality brickwork, Bad quality plaster, it will last for a year or two till they get the payment. So this kind of attitude, but in conservation, this will not work. Conservation, it is very, very important. The workmanship is very important. And whatever conservation measures that we do as a conservation architect or a consultant, we have to make sure that our buildings are durable. Doesn't the problem doesn't come up in the next five years or 20 years. I will say once you do the 
proper conservation buildings should not have any problem for the next 20 25 years at least but you find uh, within five years the building there was problem again in conservation work there is bad quality workmanship or lack of attention to details you do a bad repair you do a wrong repair the building needs if a building needs immediate attention in the next five years so our centers please take these aspects into account and a craftsman understand the technology of his craft and he will do a proper job if you don't know he will just all this he will advise you and you just have to listen to him and he, he doesn't mind doing he will not never come and boast over you a mason will never come and boast over you because he you he respects your degree and all those things you just have to extract knowledge and his experience and apply it in the building but you were uh, you were uh, uh, as a sites uh, architect or site conservation architect might try to boast over you the moment they know that you don't know. The moment you leave the site engineer, we say, see, he has 10 years of experience. He has taken a master's from UK. See, he doesn't know even the basics. He will tell the client like that. The site engineers or some of the site architects might tell. So, but then the mason will never ditch you. So the labor contract and over time led to decrease in quality. And this, there is a, this is what is happening. I'm just giving this, this is not a modern building. I just gave it in the brick. The plastering below the sunshade is very durable. The plastering on the outside, it has developed so many cracks in a short time because the cement develops shrinkage cracks in a much faster way. The same mortar, the same mason would have done both the plastering, but that overhang protects the painting as well as the plaster. So the overhang is a design detail which is very, very important. Similarly, in the buildings, there are a lot of design details which are very, very important in this. This is only three inches, but you can see the build of the wall is quite durable. It can protect because that three inches scoping is a design detail which will increase the durability of a plastered wall. Whether it is cement plaster or a lime plaster, this is a lime plastered wall. Somebody has put in a ventilator at the back, which is done with cement, but you can see very little overhang this was done. I know this building, uh, this is more than 100 years old, this building, and uh, still the pl lime plaster is extremely doing well with very little overhang. That three inches projection with detail which you will give on. Look at this building, which is, I mean, this building would have been hardly less than 10 years, and this is the way it has developed cracks. I mean, some of the I mean, I, have reason, I mean, there are buildings which develop huge issues. I always say, I mean, we do repair of concrete buildings. When I studied in UK in 1986-87, I told you that this was one of the best courses across the world. There were only two books on concrete conservation in my library. Now, if you just Google, I, in my library, there are now 10 books. My personal library has 10 books. Now, if you just Google concrete conservation, you will find 100 books. At least 100 books in Amazon. The field has changed. 30 years it has undergone. There were times when people thought concrete is going to last forever. But now people know that concrete is not going to last forever. This is very, very important. Now, one thing is that now is the time for climate change and sustainability, uh, sustainability global warming, etc. See, conservation is the greenest building one can think about. Because you are recycling the whole building. You are not recycling doors or windows or some of that. The whole building is being recycled. This is the best conserved. This is the greenest building that you can do. But if a conserved building never gets the green stamp, green architecture stamp, I think it is the fault of the conservation architects that we are not able to lobby for it. I try to tell my clients, if you conserve this building, you are doing, you are being very sound in terms of ecology. And you use less materials, less input is happening. There are a lot of things which is happening because of that. That is why, the so I just don't want to go into it. There are a lot of studies done that uh, the greenest building is one which is already existing. And we make least impact on the environment. So as a person, who, uh, my practice is 50% conservation. My 50% is the greenest buildings that I do. I do new buildings. But that 50 person is not as green as the 50 person conserved buildings that I do. Of course, I'm considered to be the so-called sustainable architecture uh, as, a, as a person who does practice a sustainable architecture. But let me tell you, I do both. 
the conserved buildings are much more sustainable and green than the buildings which I do. So, and this is one point with the conservation architects have to drive into the society and to the people. Now, just coming back, just concluding the only one or two slides. One thing is that it is not the amount that uh, you experience that counts. There might be people with 25 years of experience. I, mean, there are, I can say I had 30 years of experience, 35 years. It is not the number of years that counts. It is the quality of the experience that counts. How did you go through that experience? Did you learn in that process? There are people who work as a site supervisor for 40 years and 50 years. Their, their knowledge still remains the same. But there are people who work only for five years but their knowledge is amazing. They can come out with solutions. So it is not the number of years, it's the quality of the experience. So when you have experience, try to give importance to quality. You as an youngster, the first few years shapes you. It is not the final level. Don't think that when I get projects, I will do everything, impossible to do it. This is exactly what happens with many youngsters. You just have to start from day one, and just try to build up this high quality of experience which comes. And the high quality of experience is very important. And there are many people, youngsters also, I said, it's a poor workman who blames his tools. Get on with the job, get, do what you have and what you can, what you are able to do. Don't blame the opportunities. Don't blame that I got only this. I've done small kind of, small, small projects. That's how I came to the stage. Now I do big projects, which is different. But 30 years ago, 25 years ago, 20 years ago, I did small projects, small conservation projects. Because especially when I got, for, I, when I worked with Intact, when I did projects for Intact, my projects were big. But all, none of the work was carried out. Everything is in the form of reports. I got fed up. So I told Mapuji, who was the secretary at that time, he was a I mean, might have been a little upset. I told him I'm tired of doing these reports and reports and reports. Nothing is happening in the field. So I'm, I'm, I'm just going, going, let, let, just getting into the private sector. And then I got into the private sector and just worked on the private sector. But it is very, very important to take up, even if it is a small project. You don't know. Even now, I try to take up small projects because you don't know there will be a day when you will not have big projects. You have to be friendly. So now with the Corona coming, I'm quite confident that my office, I'm not sent anybody out of my office. I paid everybody. And I'm planning to take some more into my office during the Corona because I've taken on even small projects even when I was doing big projects. But big projects are going to get short, but small projects will happen at one way or the other. So this is, this is, this is very important. Now, age and experience. This is I tried to explain it earlier. Don't think that you are only 25 years old and 24 years old. It is the determination, it is the attitude, and just don't underestimate yourself. I mean, you can do wonders depending on the project compared with a 40-year-old 40, 40 or 50-year-old person. It is the amount that you, the, if you remember the fact which I told you in the beginning, love the historic people, be in love with it. Now, how can you be in love with it? See it, observe it, look at it. Be, I mean, you will see slowly how emotionally you get attached to the building. It is very, very important to be emotionally attached to historic buildings. Passion is very important. I mean, so the, the, some others will call it passion. I said, that's what I'm saying. I said, be in love with the building. And this is, this is very, very important. Now, many youngsters, this is one of the questions which people, can you make money in conservation? I mean, I, uh, if you ask me, if am I making money in conservation, I will say yes, but after 30 years or after 25 years. Whether it's, uh, I mean, we see, I might be one, I'm, I might be, my office will be one of the big offices where so many conservation projects are doing. We are doing Musiris, which is a huge project. We are doing Aleppi, where 200 pros projects. So like that, if we went, we are doing pro big projects, but to make money is not very easy. This is the case with most of the architects. If you are ethical, it is difficult to make money. 
but money will come at one point of time at one point of time money will come in so it so it is impossible to make money in the beginning if you are able to get a little bit better than salary if you are able to pay for the overheads and things i think you get a decent salary and you are able to pay the overheads pay the staff that's it i will say that i have started making only money only for the last 3 years and i have checked it with other famous architects and conservation they also have said i have i have dialogued with many of the people and they also told me the same thing vigas delavari is he has won 18 unesco awards and all those things i have discussed with him. he asked me how do you manage how he says so this is the case with most of the people so don't think that we are all minting money or making money no it is not there it is not easy to make money or i it's i mean it's not only to do with conservation to do with every profession one of the interior i mean interior designers who my work with uh, he was a carpenter who became a very expensive i mean he used to charge the highest fees uh, of interior for the interior design work he did, he did projects all over india he was basically a carpenter no qualifications no degree but he used to do for some of the rich, richest people like mamuti mohan lal uh, and big shots i mean all over india so he was very he was costing double the uh, amount that normally other people and uh, and he, he used to tell me a, a story i mean he is not a story i mean it's he said that this is true for most of the professions he said beni there is a beginning stage where you have a lot of ideas but no projects this is the you are all in such a stage you have finished your studies and you have started of your own you have a lot of ideas but no projects this is the first stage then the second stage comes you have projects you have ideas but you don't make money and this is the second stage of it if you can be ethical be quality conscious and do good quality work and pass the two first and second stage there is a third stage you don't have to go in search of projects projects will come in search of you you don't have to do much hard work and money will also come to you so he told me that beni i am in the third stage i have worked very hard in the beginning i mean he was older than me he was more than 15 years at least 15 years older than me he passed away unfortunately i did his house we worked together on some of uh, few projects and uh, i was so when i was designing his house because he was doing only interior design so was not so he, so when i designed this house he told me i mean we used to share so many stories and so many of these things so this was one of the story which i tell so uh, don't go after money money will come in come back come in search of you so don't think that it is there but it is a it is not very easy easy to do it if you do the right thing and if you make the right decisions in your career and if you do enough hard work and you have the right attitude it will come come in search of you don't go in search of money because they we have many people make compromises in the first and second stage they never reach the first stage that is what happens with many of the youngsters which i am uh, i am seeing so i think this is the last slide and this is there i just wanted to give you a kind of thing how to deal with uh, my my thing because uh, when uh, uh, sanjay asked me to talk to the youngsters and this is what i just thought i will put as a thought process now uh, 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 so that is what i just try to put it put it together okay so that's it so is there any questions or discussions uh, or clarifications uh, 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 benny will you stop sharing your screen now yeah yeah i'll just stop the screen just give me a second please yeah right thank you very very much benny it it i am sure this will make a primer now we have to turn it into a primer for uh, we'll turn it into a book <laughs> primer for uh, starting out in conservation because uh, in the beginning when you were talking and i was thinking where are we going where are we going with this talk and then slowly a lot of answers started coming to, a, to after half point after the interval sort of time then a lot of answers started coming one of the points that you uh, took up in the beginning was uh, intuition and i was just thinking that uh, 
you know, today when a child is born, he can straight away uh, work with gadgets. They can they naturally know how to work with a mobile phone or how to use a remote control or even to operate a, a computer. It it is knowledge that somehow gets there. And it doesn't matter whether that child is born today in a village or in the city, they seem to have the same intuitive capacity with the digital medium, which you and I, when we were born, would have had difficulty with. Uh, so, so there is something to say about uh, intuitive capacities and all that. Uh, I... I also feel that, you know, the, the social construct also helps with the intuitive capacity. And uh, there is a, an additional requirement, which is uh, a desire for problem solving. Uh, if there is intuitive capacity, but there's no desire to problem solve, maybe things may not work. So how do you see that? Okay, Sanjay, you see the thing is, intuition you are a, you will be able to go achieve i mean that intuitive capacity in you you will be able to achieve it more if you have a serious interest in what you are doing or passion in what you are doing absolutely uh, that is why i said you love the building and you just get involved with it passion and love for the buildings is very very important this is something which is not there in many of the youngsters and this is something which will go. See, why a child is able to do all the mobile? He is very keen on learning all these things. Try. He experiments. Which is same thing. You have to experiment. And whatever these qualities which a child has at the age of 10, with all these things, when you come to the architecture school, one year in architecture school, the intuitive capacity is gone. Where do you lose the intuitive capacity? Because you, you get some attitude or you get something. And when you come to the college, the faculty says, no, this is not correct. How can you design a living room in the first floor? How can you have the dining room first and living room second? Why can't, how, how can you have the, uh, have a building with a, where the lintel and the uh, lintel above the window and the lintel above the door is not at the same height? So all these things which is there, we are putting our own restriction. This way. Various people have put it like thinking out of the box. Uh, all those things. So, but I will say we have the high passion, high interest. The earlier you pick up these qualities, the better it is. And it keeps on increasing and increasing over a period of time. My intuitive capacity has grown up over the years by working with the craftsmen, with the other architects, or by interacting with... I've learned from the people who have worked with me. As I said, the, I, a lot of my knowledge is based on my experience with masons and carpenters and craftsmen. Because they teach you all these things without thinking that it is knowledge. But uh, when you go and ask an architect, they'll be reluctant. Now, uh, we, uh, when we were in uh, conservation school, when I was in conservation school, it was a diploma course. It was mandatory for us to spend a lot, uh, as much time in the shop, in the workshops, in the museum, for example, there was a carpentry. So you were required to spend time in the carpentry. And I used to spend more than extra time in the carpentry. Or you were, there was a department for cutting mounts, doing framing and stuff like that. So, but that has gone out of the education system now. They've taken that component out and put in a bit more of theory, which I'm not sure helps uh, beyond a point. Uh, because uh, if I'm talking to a carpenter, I know how to do something. I can cut a 45 degree angle and I can join it in a particular way. I may not do the best job, but I know how, how things work. So when I'm talking to a carpenter, it is... The carpenter cannot tell me no, this can't be done or he will not be able to tell me how to do it because you know how it can be done. So it's easier to talk to the carpenter. I think that uh, uh, in our uh, schools, a certain amount of practical uh, education and this respect for the craftsmen, uh, for, the, for the people who are working 
is i think quite important uh, as you said uh, in your in your uh, york education there was this component where you were interacting with people who actually work with their hands so that i think makes a difference i suppose yeah uh, that is true and once you work with them your respect towards them grows it is a mutual respect which develops yes and yes. that is what is missing in the present uh, context I, i also feel from my own experience that uh, there is more <laughs> of attempt in the beginning to get to a office environment rather than to get to the site environment which you know you can learn only as much from your drawings unless you interact with the building or your site uh, which tells you so much more than what your and even depending on how well you have done your drawings that's another uh, different, <laughs> different issue uh, what i what level of details you or pains you have taken to do that drawing so uh, i think the youngsters what they should try is to get this bookish knowledge anybody can get it reading a book we should try to get that other dimension other thing which is the, i mean people call it practical experience or traditional knowledge or knowledge system or whatever it is once you have both there is nobody can beat you yeah that is there and people respect it is not the age which matters it is the knowledge which matters so if somebody has knowledge uh, then people uh, will respect you i have learned it through all these years of my experience even when i was very young i was respected by many because i knew certain things which many others did not i was able to deliver things in a different way and i i attribute it to my experience and knowledge that is why i said it is not the number of years which matters the quality of the experience which matters and how that is, uh, how that experience has been imbibed and how that experience is put off shri you want to say something yes i mean uh, uh, thanks very much it's fantastic talk beni i mean something that uh, i mean if i i in my initial stages of my profession i would have really loved and still now it is very valid the questions some of the questions that you actually answered very much is what a beginner will ask you know money is definitely something that we all need to know and of course somebody starting a profession would look into and thanks very much for really detailing about it and i liked i loved the expression quality of experience than the years of experience thing i mean that's amazing i mean that is something as that has to be as you said written to be in a book you know because we always say oh this guy has got this much of experience so that should be great i mean that might not be true actually you know so the quality of experience i had good teachers so i, I worked with good people and one is sitting out there but you know uh, yes the point is that uh, the how the good people you work with and uh, the how about what you learn from them by working with them is absolutely important some very interesting things and there are some questions before i come to that questions i mean i am i am very much uh, uh, impressed about uh, looking into details of the basics uh, of conservation i mean you know like having some kind of a protection covering over the wall does a lot and so that kind of pure basics of conservation that as you said which doesn't require much of an education i mean 8 9 10 standard should be good enough to actually do a wonderful uh, work is amazing and working with craftsmen learning with craftsmen we all did that i mean we all learned that and that is how you learn there are some questions how you understand a building you know which i'll come to and which exactly you have explained in coming slides you know that some questions came earlier before you explained that but i got one question which you were touching on you know climate change so since i work in some areas which has got flat uh, roofs and due to the climate change the rainfall has increased you know so i mean do i mean i i am very against to changing the uh, actual uh, you know fabric of the building i mean so i i believe that it should look like that but you know sometimes you know it's a tricky question how to handle that you know with the change in climate you know the atmosphere change and normal change you know in 800 years 400 years you know whatever so how to tackle them you mean the flat roofs 
Yeah, I mean, in, in any in any case of you know the temper, the uh, environmental changes, the buildings when they were built at a point of time was built uh, looking at that atmosphere at that point of time. Now the times have changed, you know. So how do one deal with that, you know? See, the each of the building poses its own problems. So, for example, the flat roofs. I mean, that is, but there were a lot of buildings built with flat roofs. I'll tell what we have done. See, flat roofs is not durable. RCC, I'm talking about concrete roofs, will not be durable over a long period of time. The simple reason, simple logic, every day the RCC slab has to expand. It has to contract, expand, contract. So 30 years, it might be 40 years. In some case of buildings where the weathering goes and everything is there, it will be 50 years or whatever it is, uh, what will be the period which is to be done. Uh, the easiest solution is to put a sloping roof on top of it, which is what many people does because whatever waterproofing. Now, one of the growing sectors in construction industry is waterproofing companies. I mean, if you just take one of very fast growing, they make a lot of money uh, mm -hmm. in, the, in, the, in the, their sector, uh, the way they market. But none of the solutions are very durable. Five years, 10 years, I mean, I, uh, 10 years is too much, five years. Uh, uh, will be reasonable. So after that, again, you have to spend a lot of amount of money trying to work towards that. One way, I mean, I just said we have done a flat roof where we have done it with a typical way of lime concrete with surki and uh, some vegetable additives, which is a traditional treatment, which is done. That might last for another 40 years, 30, 40 years, if it is done well. But where we have done large areas like 10,000 square feet, Still, I mean, you see, a lot of these things depends on the workmanship also. Even if you have the proper materials, even if you assume that is the best workmanship has been, still it can be defective. There has been some cases, but it is, it is a cost, it's a costly proportion. Where the roof is not to be accessed, we are given very, I'd say, five